I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes and pray. Join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I now invite you to stand with me, to speak through me your very word to your people. And I pray that you may open their hearts to what you want them to understand today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Five-year-old Johnny was in the kitchen with his mother as she made supper. She asked him to go into the pantry to get a can of tomato soup, but he didn't want to go alone. It's dark in there, he said, and I'm scared. She asked again, but Johnny persisted. Finally, she said, it's okay, Johnny. Jesus will be with you. He is right in there. And so Johnny hesitantly walked to the pantry, slowly opened the door. He peeked inside, saw it was really dark, and started to leave when all of a sudden an idea came into his mind, and he opened the door again, and he peeked in, and he said, Jesus, if you are in there, would you please hand me that can of tomato soup? Today's message, as you now are well aware, is don't be afraid. Have you ever said those words to someone? A friend, a spouse, or maybe your child who has just come into your room because they'd had a bad dream, and you tell them, don't be afraid. Has someone ever said those words to you, perhaps? Don't be afraid. As a child, or maybe even as an adult, have you ever been afraid? Or perhaps, are you afraid even right now? Fear is a powerful emotion. It can uh, grab us and grip us with immobilizing terror and dread that we can do nothing. One popular American writer, uh, in one of his books, he, uh, he was writing about fear, and he relates the story of a thief who became well-known in America in the 1800s. The author said the following about the thief. He was a professional thief. His name stirred fear as the desert wind stirs tumbleweeds. He terrorized Wells Fargo stage, uh, stage line for 13 years, roaring like a tornado in and out of Sierra Nevadas, spooking the most rugged frontiers men. In journals from San Francisco to New York, his name became synonymous with the dangers of the frontier. During his reign of terror between 1875 and 1883, he is credited to uh, stealing the bags and the breath away from 29 different stagecoach crews. And he did all of that without firing a single shot. His weapon was his reputation. His ammunition was intimidation. A hood hid his face, so no victim ever saw him. No artist ever sketched his features. No sheriff could ever track his trail. He never fired a shot or took a hostage, he didn't have to. His presence was enough to paralyze everyone. Black Bart was his name, a hooded bandit, armed with a deadly weapon. You know, Black Bart reminds me of another thief that's been around for almost as long as the human race has existed, 
one who is still riding in the trails of human life today, and one who is found in the trails of Second Chronicles, uh, rather Second Kings that we read earlier on. I know you know him, but like Black Bat, you've never seen his face either. You can't describe his voice or sketch his profile, but when he is near, you know, you know it in your heart that he's there. So for instance, if you have ever been in hospital ill, you felt the leather brush of his hand against yours. If you have ever sensed that someone is following you, for instance, you felt his chill breath down your neck. If you ever, ever had to do something or say something that involved confronting someone and lay awake all night thinking about it all, he was the one who stole your slumber. You know him. He was a thief who left you your palms sweaty as you went for a job interview. He was the con man who convinced you to swap your integrity for popularity. It was him who got you to say or do nothing rather than deal with the problem. Keep your mouth shut when you should have spoken. And it was this outlaw who whispered in your ear, no one really cares about you when you are about to reach out for help from someone. He is the black bat of our souls. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your valuables. And he won't go after your car. What he wants is your peace of mind. What he wants is your joy. His name, I guess you've guessed it already, is fear. Fear was to steal your joy. Take your courage and leave you cold, naked, and trembling. His mode of oppression is to manipulate you with the mysterious things and taunt you with the unknown. Fear of death, fear of failure, fear of defeat, fear of rejection, fear of being alone, perhaps. Fear of God, fear of living. Yes, his arsenal is vast. And what is his goal? To create cowardly, joyless souls. You see, friends, fear doesn't want you to make that journey to the mountaintop. Fear figures that if he can rattle you just enough. You will take your eyes off the lofty peaks of life and settle for the dull, drab, safe existence in the uh, flatlands. Today, I stop by because I just want to encourage you with the words, don't be afraid. It is a phrase that occurs, I'm told, 88 times in the Bible and is mostly spoken by God to his people. And when these words are spoken by God, we can trust them. This phrase occurs in our story for today, found in 2 Kings chapter 6. And we're going to read part of it, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 and 17. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 and 17. And I read, when, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early that, uh, the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. 
Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You know, the event takes place during the time when the, uh, the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Before we begin our story, let me just introduce to you some of the characters in the story. There is uh, Elisha. He is a powerful prophet. He was a student and successor of prophet Elijah, as we know. And Elisha did some pretty awesome miracles. He healed the sick, multiplied food, and even raised the dead. Then you also have uh, Joram. He, he is the king of, of the north, the son of Ahab and Jezebel. And we know a lot about what happened between uh, Elijah, Ahab, and Jezebel. And we cannot expect, therefore, that the relationship between uh, Elisha, uh, the success of Elijah, and uh, Joram, the success of uh, Ahab and Jezebel, could be warm. It wasn't a very warm relationship. Then you have Ben-Hadid. He is the king of the Arameans, a nation that was fighting against and also harassing the northern kingdom. Then finally, you have the unnamed servant of Elisha. And there isn't much we know about him, except when he comes up in the story at this point. These are the main characters in the, in the uh, story. It opens with ben Hadid on a hunt, and he is after King Joram, the king of the north. He, he wants him badly, and ben Hadid kept running into problems. He would gather his men together and map out a strategy. But every time he set up an ambush, Joram would always avoid the area. And this was beginning to annoy ben Hadid. Now, what was happening, unknown to ben Hadid, was that Elisha the prophet was warning the king of Israel about where the ambush was going to take place. He did know because God told him. But even though Joram was not a very good king, even though him and Elisha were not very good friends, but Elisha still revealed to him the message of God. And whenever Elisha would warn the king, the king would first set out uh, scouts to make sure that the information that he got from Elisha was true. You see, he didn't trust and exactly like Elisha. Uh, but every time the king of Israel checked on the place that Elisha has indicated, he found that Elisha's words were true. And he was therefore always on the guard in these areas. And ben Hadid's ambushes always failed. Well, it didn't take too long before ben Hadid had had enough. He was pretty sure that there was a spy somewhere amongst his stuff. It had to be an inside job. One of his officers must be guilty of treason. There was no way, just no way, that Joram could be so lucky all these times. So he calls all his men in his chambers, and with glowing eyes and fiery words, he demanded, I want to know right now which of you is on the side of the king of Israel. Who is guilty of treason? And all men looked at each other, afraid to speak. 
But finally, one broke the silence and said, No, none of us, my Lord, the King. It is not us. It's the prophet Elisha who is in Israel. He knows all. He knows all the words that the king speaks in these very chambers and tells them to the king of Israel. Now whether uh, this officer knew for sure that this was the truth or whether it was just a, a lucky guess that he made in a time of difficulty, we do not know. But what we know is that the Arameans were well aware of Elisha's powers, that they had witnessed uh, these powers firsthand when Naaman, the general of the Aramean army, was healed of leprosy by Elisha. This explanation seemed to uh, satisfy the enraged king who replied, go or find where this Elisha is so I can capture him. Now, friends, it sounds very strange to me that King ben a whole king who is supposed to be very wise, would make a plan after what he had just been told about Elisha. He would make such a plan. He has just been told that Elisha knows whatever the king says in his own chambers. He has been told that uh, with, with this ability, Elijah has been able to foil ben Hadid's plans to capture King Joram. ben Hadid does not even stop, uh, take time to uh, even consider the fact that even as he finishes briefing his man, Elisha already knows what is planned for him. And that Elisha could uh, then simply uh, move and go elsewhere before ben Hadid's men set out to capture him. ben Hadid does not take time to ask the question, if Elisha can tell what I say in my chambers, what other powers does he have? What might he be able to do to my men? He makes the plan to go and capture prophet Elisha despite this knowledge. Friends, it has been said many times that power corrupts, but I want to submit to you this afternoon that power also blinds. The power of sin blinds men, all of us, to the plain reality that there is a power above all powers, a power that no military strength can conquer, a power that no secret intelligence organization cannot do. It is the ultimate power that will one day fall upon all other powers and crush them to powder. It is the power of heaven. I just wish that all the other powers of the world would recognize and accept the authority of the heavenly power. That would make such a big difference. And yet, all Ben Hadid could think of at that moment was that he was a powerful king and that he was going to demonstrate that he could get anyone he wants Friends, we must be aware of the blinding power, uh, the blinding effect of power. So it wasn't long before the report came back that Elisha was in Dothan, a small village about two miles north of Samaria, which was the capital of the uh, northern kingdom. Ben Hadid wanting to make sure Elisha didn't sleep away, uh, dispatched a strong force of men under the cover of darkness, which is when uh, evil likes to operate. And before the sun rose, the entire city of Dothan was surrounded. 
And early that morning, when Elisha's servant woke up and went outside, wiping a slip out of his eyes, when he raised his face to a catch a glimpse of the new day, his eyes caught sight of an army on horses and chariots surrounding the city. Immediately, in fear, he ran back and was met by Elisha, who himself was stopping out outside at the time. And with a voice of desperation, the servant cried out, Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? But the prophet of God, with bold calmliness, said to his trembling servant, who was gripped with fear, Don't be afraid. Because those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then the prophet of God lifted his hands to the Lord and prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the servant. And when he, the, the servant looked up this time, in addition to the Aramean army, he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire, an army of God that had come to protect Elisha and himself. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine his excitement when he saw all this? Have you ever like Elisha's servant one morning woke up and went outside and found that your city was surrounded, that the enemy had come during the night and now you are trapped, afraid, and you don't know what to do. Sometimes the enemy that surrounds us is uh, a health problem of our own and sometimes of a loved one. Sometimes it might be a financial problem. Sometimes it is a relational problem. Or other times it is fear of rejection and failure. But whoever or whatever it is, the bottom line is, fear has gripped you and you are paralyzed, trembling and unable to move. Not just your limbs, but you are unable to move even your lips to say a prayer to God. Your joy is gone. What do you do when problems surround you? And there seems to be no way of escape and nowhere to turn to. Now as I read this account during the week, I became convinced that more often than not, we pray the wrong prayer under such circumstances. We pray, Lord, give me money. Lord, heal me. Lord, change my wife or husband. We pray these and many other prayers when we should be praying, Lord, open my eyes. And I don't know, in fact, I doubt very much that it is a prayer that prayer is a prayer that God will ever say no to. So we need to pray. Pray that God will help us see through our problems. See through our trials. See through our difficulties and see him because he is always there. That is exactly what James is talking about in the first chapter of his letter. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and pers perseverance must finish its work so that you may mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it, it will be given to him. 
But when he asks, he must believe, not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Do problems of life toss you about? Do they blow you here and there? Are you unable when the flood waters of this life begin to rise? Do you find it hard to consider difficult times as a reason for rejoicing? If you answered yes to any of those questions, it tells me two things about you. One, that you are very normal. Two, you are very honest. Because we all have times when we are unstable amidst difficulties. But God wants his people to know that they do not have to be afraid. So, what do we do? How can we keep our boat stable when the waters of life rage? James says, brothers, if you want to see trials as a cause of rejoicing, if you need wisdom to stable your ship, ask God. You need to pray, believing, and God will give you the wisdom to stand up under trials to consider your difficulties, pure joy. And if ever you, you, you find yourself in a situation that renders you too weak to even pray, you know, you, you, you're so much trouble, you can't even close your eyes and call upon the Lord. Do what Elisha's servant did. Go to a brother or a sister who is already standing firm, a brother whose eyes already see God, and ask them to pray for you. And God will open our eyes. And let me tell you what will happen when God opens our eyes. We will see the true nature of the battle. Elisha 7 thought the, the battle was uh, two against a thousand men. Just him and Elisha against all those men with swords and horses and chariots. But he was wrong. It wasn't just him and Elisha. No, it was him, Elisha, and the armies of the Almighty God against those forces of the enemy. And I want to submit to you, friends, that any time we are standing next to God, we are in the majority. You see, when we, like Elisha's servant, open our eyes, we will see the true nature of the conflict when fears grip us and steals our joy and immobilizes our service. When we feel outgunned and outnumbered, if we would only open our eyes, we would see that the struggle is not ours. As Paul says, we will understand that the struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers who are at work in this world to hurt, to destroy, to grip us with fear, and to steal our joy. When our eyes are opened, we will see the nature of the battle, and we will see what we are, that we are not alone. It is not us against them, but that God who is with us is against them. And when we open our eyes, we will also experience the presence of God. When we open our eyes, we see the Lord, and we are reminded that he is there, as he promised. And surely, I am with you, even to the end of the time. You see, friends, 
there is something about being in the presence of someone who is stronger than we are. There is something about that which just soothes our fears and melts the terror out of our hearts. A child who, who after a terrible dream uh, goes into the parents' bedroom is calm. A boy confidently walks by the bullies who a day before have just beaten him because his older brother is now walking beside him. The wife who has had a terrible day at work when everything seemed to be against him rests very peacefully and quietly in the arms of his husband, her husband rather. The shepherd boy with just a sling can face a ten-foot giant that has an entire nation shaking in their boots because he knows the almighty God is with him. When we open our eyes, we will experience God's presence. And when we feel his touch, hear his voice, then we know he is there. And like the child, the little brother or the wife, and like that shepherd boy, we will find our fears quickly subsiding and we rest in the presence of our Lord, who is stronger than we are. Remember I said earlier that the phrase don't be afraid appears 88 times in the Bible and mostly spoken by God or by Jesus. And you know, the fact that it's spoken by God, that is significant. And it is also significant to note that nearly every time after saying, don't be afraid, God then reassured the people of his presence. When Isaac, for instance, was afraid, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid. I'm with you. That's Genesis 26, 24. When the prophet Jeremiah was afraid of the king of Babylon, God said to him, do not be afraid of him, for I am with you. Jeremiah 42, 11. In his farewell speech to the Israelites, Moses told the people as they were about to enter the promised land, do not be afraid because the Lord your God goes with you. When we open our eyes, we, we, we don't only you know, see the true nature of the, the struggle that we are in. We don't only experience the presence of God, but we are also reminded of God's past victories. When we have our eyes shut, friends, during hard times, we find it difficult to see the many victories that God has already brought through us through. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, Moses is talking uh, to the people of Israel again, entering the promised land, and he anticipates the, 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 the feelings of fear they will have. And he says, you may say to yourselves, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember well that the Lord your God, uh, what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. You saw with your own eyes the great trials, the, uh, the, the miraculous signs and wonders, the mighty hand and outstretched arm with which the Lord your God brought you out. The Lord your God will do the same to all the people you now fear. Do not be terrified of them, for the Lord your God who is among you is a great and awesome God. Moses tells his people to remember well. Rewind, he says. 
Look at all that God did for you. He delivered you from a 430-year-old bondage. He swept the mighty armies of uh, Egypt away as easily as a person sweeps the floor. He, he brought a mighty empire to her knees just for you. And I want to ask you this afternoon, dear friend, if you remember. Do you remember? Do you remember how many mountains he has moved out of your way just so you can get to where you are today? Do you remember how many seas he has opened just so you can cross over to the other side? Do you remember how many valleys he has leveled to make sure you remain on the higher ground of sanity? Do you remember how much dark clouds he has dispelled just so you can see him clearly? Do you remember, friends, how many laws of nature he has broken in the past just so you can uh, be counted the amongst the living today? Do you remember? If you have forgotten all that, do you at least remember how he went against all protocol and hung upon that ragged cross just so you and I can have eternal life. If the truth be told, friends, you and I should daily be going about proclaiming had it not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? We need to remember. We need to remember well what God has done in our past. We need to replay the tape of our life over and over and see all that he has done. Look how through Christ he has brought the prince of this world, the prince of darkness, to his knees for us. If we don't remember, friends, then when difficulties come, we will say this, this problem is too big for me. We will be heard to say, I can never make it through all of this. We will find ourselves saying, it is just too much. How can I drive these problems out? You know, friends, we, we can't drive them out. Israel couldn't drive them out. You can't drive them out. I can't. But only God can drive them out. And he has in the past. I, I can't tell you how many times God has come to my rescue and sadly I don't know how many more times God has to bring me through this storm before I can fully trust him but all I know every time I remember is that God does come through When we don't, have, we don't have to go through these storms of life alone, God wants to go with us. As a matter of fact, God the Son died on that cross so that he could go through these storms with us. And it is his power that will deliver us if God is for us, who can be against us? No one, friends. No situation. Elisha told his servant, don't be afraid. Because those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Listen, friends. God is greater than our enemies. Whatever our enemies are,
God is greater than them. And the second, uh, Chronicles 37, uh, 32 verse 7, King Hezekiah says the same. We see King Hezekiah here saying essentially the same uh, thing. And this is over 100 years, years later. And he tells the commanders of the armies, of his armies, uh, to not be afraid of the Assyrians who were approaching Jerusalem. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and discouraged because of the king of Assyria and his vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. And the Apostle John, 700 years later, uh, said much the same thing in 1 John 4, verse 4, when he said, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Are you afraid? What are you afraid of? God wants his people to know, he wants you to know that we do not need to be afraid as long as he is on our side. And I hear someone ask, but how do I know he is on my side? How do I know he is with me? The fact is, he is with us as long as we are with him. Be on his side, and he is on your side. In case you're wondering what happened to Elisha in his servant, I, I will tell you. We don't have time to read the rest of the story, but when the Arabian army came towards Elisha, the Lord struck them with blindness. He closed their eyes. You know, the Lord, friends, will not only open your eyes so that you can see his protection, but he will also close the eyes of your enemies as well so that they may not hurt you. And Elisha went out and met them, and he said to them, I'll lead you to, to the man that you're looking for. And Elisha led them right into the city of Samaria. And once inside the city, the Lord restored their sight. And they freaked out, and the king of Israel asked Elisha, can, can I kill them? And Elisha says, no. Instead, let's give them a feast. And after they finished eating and drinking, they went back home to their king. And to cut the long story short, the Arameans stopped raiding the land of Israel. Do you have an enemy, an enemy of fear surrounding your city right now? God says, don't be afraid. Helen Lemel, in her song that we, we love and sing so often, captured what we need to do when fear comes riding in. O oh soul, she says, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness, you see. There is light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and will follow him there. Over our sin, no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. His word shall, fail, shall not fa fail you, he promised. Believe in him and all will be well. Then go out to a world that is dying. His perfect 
salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Child of God, don't be 